Good evening and welcome everyone to another lecture in the 23 lecture series of our newest exhibition season, Contagion. Science Gallery Bengaluru is a part of an international network of galleries, university linked uh, network of galleries, which tries to bridge the gap between research and the public at large. Contagion is our first fully online full exhibition season. And uh, as a part of an exhibition season, we have public lecture series, we have films, we have masterclasses and workshops and events. One of the reasons behind having a public lecture series is to bring to bear upon a single topic, research that has been carried out in disciplines that are very diverse in nature. So for us, the sciences means the human and the natural sciences both. And therefore in our lecture series, we have historians, sociologists, art, artists, curators, epidemiologists, public health specialists, clinicians, laboratory researchers, all of them speaking to the single phenomenon of contagion in this case. This lecture series is supported by the Indian National Science Academy, and I am absolutely delighted that Professor Chandrima Shah is with us today as well. Um, if you are interested in the history of pandemics, which is um, what Dora will speak to us today about, do check out Contagion in the 21st Century, which is an exhibit, um, a, a small exhibit about the life and work of Robert Koch. But also do try to attend the, a walkthrough in the museum of the Robert Koch Institute that we have organized. You'll find the details for this event uh, in the chat box later uh, this evening. Also have a look at Controlling the Plague in British India, which is a photo essay by Christos Linteris, who is going to speak to us tomorrow as well. So coming to today's lecture, um, we are delighted, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome a colleague, uh, Dora Varga, uh, to speak to us about after the end of epidemics. And I'll say a word or two about, you know, how historians of science and historians of medicine are slightly different and how the Welcome Trust has made all the difference, but that's for later. This is Dora's moment. Um, Dora is a senior lecturer at the Department of History and the Welcome Center for Cultures and Environments of Health at the University of Exeter. She's also a co-editor of the journal Social History of Medicine. Her work spans from the politics of epidemic management to public health systems and access to therapeutics. She has written about the global infrastructure of diphtheria antitoxins, the politics of vaccination during the Cold War, which she will speak to us today about, um, hospital care of disabled children on, and all under 20th century communism. Do remember, you can type your questions in the Q&A box and we would love to, of course, have your feedback in terms of what you feel about the lecture, what you gained from it. We'd love to learn more so that we can keep doing better and up our own standards. Thank you for being here today. Dora, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you so much for um, the invitation. I'm so happy to be part of this um, wonderful event, or um, I don't even, I don't think we have the right word for, <laughs> for uh, such, a, such a wonderful initiative. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll start uh, without further ado to um, start my talk. And uh, what I would want to focus on today <clears throat> is, uh, is the endings and, uh, of epidemics and what happens after, which is something that I have been thinking about for quite a while. And it has become <clears throat> uh, quite um, uh, relevant uh, these days as we're in the middle of a huge pandemic. I think um, at any point in time, we would need to think about uh, how we tell the stories of epidemics and uh, <clears throat> how we see the endings and uh, how we approach them, both in terms of policy, in terms of personal experience, and in terms of history, of course. So I'll <clears throat> start right uh, away. And first, I would like to talk a tiny bit about why I think history matters um, in, in this situation. Um, one would think that it's, um, it's kind of a luxury to think about the past when the moment is so loaded. But I would make the argument that it's actually very crucial to think about history and to uh, take that on board in the way that we try to understand the world around us. 
First of all, epidemics are not are unique uh, in time and place, so they're not uniform, uh, and we can experience that um, uh, they're different uh, at the same time in different parts of the world, as it is all too obvious um, uh, today. But I would also stress that history, one thing that history doesn't do is to have um, to give lessons to be learned. You can't import um, the kind of lessons taken away from one epidemic and project them wholesale on another one. So, but then, you know, what's the point in thinking about it in historical terms? Well, real-time in-depth analysis is usually not possible. There's just simply too much going on, um, too many aspects happening at the same time. It's quickly changing, and we can't access um, uh, that. We don't have time simply for that kind of analysis. But historical research permits the detailed understandings and exploring stakes and long-term processes so we can take basically questions and points of entries of analysis to the current moment and uh, use them to help us to think about um, uh, uh, what's going on. So what I mean is, for instance, understanding the context. What happened in the past is not isolated in the past. It informs and has shaped um, structures, inequalities, and frameworks in which epidemic response operates in. And also, so that's that's one of the one of the key things that uh, we to understand what the problems are, where they're coming from. We understand what uh, we need to understand what happened in the past. And the other important point is that with a his, uh, with a historical view, we can explore unintended consequences, and we can um, pay attention to the temporalities of epidemics. And time is, of course, the bread and butter of historians. And this is something that I would like to talk about, how we see those temporalities, how we see endings, crises, endings, and what happens after. And this brings me to, to has brought me to think a bit more about the epidemic narrative. With narratives, um, narratives are not just, you know, storytelling, um, but we're constructing meanings of epidemics as they unfold. We're telling the story of what is happening now. Um, this is also for us personally, uh, how we have experienced uh, the, the, the recent months, the recent years, what we're um, experiencing now, how that fits into um, our life, our life story. Um, it also um, informs of us uh, how we see this as a part of our country's history uh, and, and how where we see this going, where they see this coming from. And the epidemic narrative of how we tell the story of an epidemic is also um, used by public, uh, by the public and public health planners looking back and evaluating, reconstructing the narrative. Okay, you know, sitting back, what happened? Um, how did this unfold? What were the problems? Um, what were the consequences? The way that we tell this story is not only about what is true and what is false. And of course, this is a very um, serious problem nowadays, uh, pointed out by many of the kind of um, issues around fake news or how certain news are termed as fake um, while others are not, how stories circulate. But there are also tools of data selection and frameworks to understand disease and health. So what we're thinking, the way that we tell the story also refers to what kind of elements we're using to build that story. What kind of data are we using? We can't tell, tell a story of, a, of an epidemic, even as we're experiencing, by incorporating every single thing. Um, it's just not possible to do that. And this kind of narrative construction becomes increasingly important in the case of new diseases, which are surrounded by scientific uncertainties. So as you know, if you think back a year ago, and um, now more than a year ago, when uh, the, the epidemic was unfolding and there was a lot of uncertainty, how it spreads, what to do, what are the efficient ways to go about curbing the disease, what will be the consequences of it, um, how do we treat it? Uh, there were so many, um, uh, so many uncertainties on so many levels that it became particularly important to understand where did this start? Where is it going? How do we place this in a broader context? And that becomes very, very um, central at some points in time. 
Now, some of these narratives are quite seductive. Um, and this is something that I've been thinking about. What is the pull? Why do we tell the story of an epidemic in a particular way? And you, we're all very familiar with this pandemic bell curve, um, which you can see here, kind of uh, acceleration, the, the crisis point, and the, the ending. And you can see here, there have been a lot, of, um, a lot of conversation in the past year about flattening the curve, making that crisis point lower in terms of incidence. This is based um, much around numbers, incidence rates, uh, or numbers of cases, numbers of deaths um, that happen during an epidemic. And this has you know, a beginning, a crisis, an end. And it serves uh, uh, very good purposes. One is to um, propel response. We're uh, going um, uh, and, and we're we're going up on the curve. You know there needs to be some kind of innovation. We can see that you know vaccine development is one of these um, things. When there's an end in sight, you know to work towards. Um, you have policies um, uh, being uh, uh, brought into practice, coping mechanisms. It's also important for us personally to see that this is not, you know, a case of getting worse and worse and will never end. There will be an end point. There will be a moment when we, just as um, riding on a roller coaster, we get to the top and then we can go down. And that is a kind of preparation that makes it easier um, uh, sometimes to, to cope. Uh, with the with the with epidemic crises, but this kind of neat curve um, doesn't always accommodate the multiplicity of the epidemic experience. So what I, what do I mean by this? Well, um, it doesn't necessarily accommodate uh, if we take the whole pandemic as a whole on uh, uh, the the different ways and varieties in which epidemics are experienced across the world, you know, where does, um, uh, where, what parts of the world are in crisis mode, what parts of the world are, uh, are currently, you know, um, go to, working towards what, um, you know, is less and less used perhaps with the recognition that there is no normalcy, um, uh, or, or we have to have a different understanding of normalcy, what are areas that haven't been touched yet, but even within societies, you know, what kind of, where does that crisis point lie for whom? And, uh, and who, is, um, who is left out of these um, points, especially the ending. So this kind of um, uh, telling and uniform telling of the story and this neat beginning crisis and end can render people and processes invisible, people who don't fit into that kind of telling, people who experience multiple crises and that don't map on this um, bell curve, or people who, for whom the epidemic is not over when um, there is, a, there is a, an endpoint declared. And I will come back to that um, in, a, in a little bit. So this is why the way that we tell the stories um, even as they happen, and also looking back matter. And, and this can uh, um, concern a lot of people in a lot of different ways. So let's um, come to the question of endings, which um, is, uh, is what I would like to focus on today. So endings are, as um, I, I think um, uh, we can all agree very easily, are very, very messy and complicated. And they are also, um, they, don't, they also bring up the question of how we determine that ending. What is, what do we mean by ending? Is it the ending, the lack of cases anymore? Is, is the ending a complete eradication of a disease like the way smallpox has ended? Or um, uh, in much of the world, polio? Um, is that, are we talking about a virus? Is it, uh, or, or a pathogen? Is it uh, a crucial point where the incidence rate is low enough for it to become, um, uh, for it not to be a major public health concern anymore? Or is it uh, a social phenomenon? So are we, <clears throat> are we talking about the ending when a large portion of society is no longer interested, involved in it, thinking about it? Uh, or is it um, 
where where do these you know where did this ending lies and these different kind of endings don't often map on the same timeline they don't map on the same timeline globally maybe the epidemic ends the pan or the pandemic ends <clears throat> in one place um, while still going on in the other or maybe it's no longer an international concern but relegated to national um, uh, uh, policies and an attention but the, the main question remains how do epidemics end who decides and who is left out so these are the questions i would like to to think about in the um, in the next um, <clears throat> Uh, in the remaining of the talk. Before we move on, I would also like to uh, mention here the importance, um, you know, coming back to, to the narratives and thinking about endings is the importance of what kind of metaphors we use. So with um, epidemics and this pandemic, it's often, especially by politicians, framed as some kind of war. It's a war against a virus, there's a common enemy that we're all fighting. It's often um, uh, portrayed as such. It's also um, a tool to mobilize people um, against, uh, against this um, uh, uh, disease. But it also is um, problematic because, uh, well, for many reasons, but regarding the endings, um, we think of wars as having a clear end, right? Um, there is a peace treaty, there's a laying down of arms, and we're over and done with it. And that is the end of the war. If you think about World War II, you know, there is a, a, what, what is called in Britain, um, a, a victory um, day. You can um, think about various different wars where there is, you know, the signing of the peace treaty and the way that we've um, learned about it in school. However, wars don't end also with a peace treaty or, you know, we can think of, 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 of the complexities with which wars end and maybe millions of people like in the end of the World War II, millions of people are still in um, uh, displaced, um, displaced people's camps um, scattered across the globe. Um, the you know people can't be demobilized from one moment to the next. There's there might be still rationing system for years or decades along the line. Different parts of a bigger war, you know, people um, different countries sign different treaties at different points in time, and so we can't you know even if we think about it as a war that also has this dual face of seeming like something that ends with a clear cutoff and actually on the ground goes on for many, many years. And so um, that is something that I would like us um, to think about. But we're going to go now into a different kind of war, the Cold War. And I would like to invite you to think with me about um, polio in the Cold War and to walk through with me a very interesting story that uh, can highlight um, the way that, that uh, epidemics um, and pandemics end, um, which is, um, of course, what uh, we all have high hopes of and what uh, we are also a very problematic aspect of um, epidemic response is vaccines. Now, vaccines uh, are very fascinating technology and hugely important in the history of uh, medicine and public health. And I would like to encourage you to think about them. And I think that will be quite easy now that we're in this moment um, to th think about a vaccine that goes beyond merely as a substance in a vial. We all know all too well, unfortunately, today that vaccine in a vial in itself will not um, uh, prevent or stop any epidemics. It has to be distributed, it has to be produced in enough numbers, it has to get to the population, it has to um, get to um, an adequate number of people, and that is, uh, is why it cannot be um, separable from vaccination. The vaccine in the vial doesn't do anything, it only does, does something once it's administered, and even for one single person, it doesn't do really anything if uh, for, for a society or for a greater um, community because it will not stop the, the transmission in itself. There's also an interesting question of vaccines going from trial to field, how we establish the efficacy of a vaccine. And this is, of course, also a pressing matter right now. 
And I would argue that social and cultural factors play a very important role in this. It matters what kind of vaccine, how it's administered. So if you need a, a super cold chain to get it from one place to the other, if you need needles and um, syringes for it, or if it's a drop of, uh, of liquid, it, uh, that will determine um, how, you know, how effectively you can, you can get it to people and how effective it will be in the, uh, in the end. So it's not merely a biological process. And vaccines, of course, are also political objects. They tell us um, a lot about the relationship of states and citizens. There's a lot of um, uh, trust is very key to vaccination. We need to trust that it works. We need to trust that it's safe. We need to trust the people who are giving it to us. Um, we need to uh, trust uh, maybe the, the country or the processes of origin that uh, enable us to make those decisions that it is safe and it is and it will be uh, and it will be efficient and finally vaccines are not universal technologies the when vaccines travel from one society to another from one political system to another from one country to another from one climate to another um, they are different they are entering very different relationships and uh, and sometimes so much so that it's even difficult to think about them as the same thing because because they are so uh, entrenched in the vaccination process itself, which is so much um, connected to social, cultural, and political factors that um, that they are they not they're not behaving exactly the same way everywhere in the world. So what I would like to talk about, and I'm trying to keep an eye on the time uh, in the second half of this talk, is this Cold War story, and then to come to um, why and how it led me to think about endings and to the after, the, what happens after, which I think is very important, and we should be already thinking about it. We should have been thinking about it <clears throat> before even the pandemic started. Vaccines and ending epidemics um, have very strong connections to and, and rely on healthcare structures. So you have to get the vaccines um, to people, which, which requires the structure to be there, the people to be there to, to um, uh, administer the vaccine and to organize this. It's a, it's a huge challenge. So it says a lot about um, different healthcare structures and the way that they end epidemics, the, the speed with which they might uh, be able to end epidemics depends on this as well. And of course, national and geopolitical context is hugely important here. And uh, I will now go into um, vaccines uh, in polio um, uh, uh, epidemics in the 1950s that created um, in the height of the Cold War um, almost uh, 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 feelings and, and which were articulated actually of there not being a Cold War. So let's see in detail. Just as you know, similar to, to, to the situation now, there was a huge, um, uh, um, a huge rise in, in, uh, in polio epidemics in the, uh, across the world. They were not happening exactly at the same time as we are, as what we're seeing now. So it was not a pandemic in this sense, but there were stronger and uh, stronger outbreaks in the 1950s, so within a decade, across the world. So it was happening everywhere and it affected everyone in some way, but it's, it wasn't so um, concentrated into, into one year. But even so, um, there was a lot of effort uh, to, to develop vaccines. There was an urgency to this because, um, because there was such an escalation in numbers uh, across the world in the people who were affected by it. And of course, um, polio is, uh, is a disease that at that time, especially um, affected mainly children. And this is a post-war moment coming out of World War II. So that was um, a particular hard hit um, to the, the populations and the societies that were trying to um, recover from the war. There were several vaccines in the running. Um, they um, 
they divided between being dead virus vaccines um, and live virus vaccines. So very different ways of approaching the vaccine um, of what goes into the vaccine, if it's a killed virus or if it's an attenuated, so weakened live virus. And Jonas Salk famously um, developed the killed virus vaccine. Um, that This was the first polio vaccine. It was licensed in the US in 1955. And uh, Soon after it was, um, uh, it was uh, that the trials proved it to be efficient. It was immediately licensed. I mean, within hours in the U.S. And very famously, it had no patent. So polio vaccines, neither salmon nor salt vaccine, were patented, and this was very important. Uh, and you know, just reflecting on um, the conversations right now along. Um, vaccine patents. This was very important because basically anybody could produce um, the, the polio vaccine. This, of course, did not mean that anybody was able to um, produce the polio vaccine or that the vaccine started immediately um, uh, spreading across the world. For instance, in the case of Hungary, which is, a, which was, uh, which is in Eastern Europe and it's a um, it was uh, uh, part of this socialist world, um, uh, sometimes called satellite states or the Eastern Bloc. Um, they did not start importing vaccines. So there was no um, polio vaccine in Hungary until 1957. And they started, um, started the import um, in the middle of an enormous outbreak. So the biggest outbreak that the country had seen so far. And so the, um, so the government mobilized everything to get their hands on vaccine. And there was a huge vaccine shortage. At this time uh, in Hungary, this was um, uh, just after the 1956 revolution where um, citizens of Hungary rebelled against the, the communist regime. And this was, um, uh, this was uh, um, uh, defeated by, um, with the help of Soviet tanks. So we are in a very um, tricky political situation here. And Hungary started importing the vaccine. And it was uh, fantastic and, and quite spectacular for me to see the newspaper articles that heralded the arrival of this American vaccine that was brought in by a West German pilot on a Swiss plane. And th these people were celebrated, absolutely celebrated and heroes um, for, for um, delivering the promise of saving children from polio. Hungary tried then to, uh, to develop um, and uh, its capabilities to produce the vaccine. And it took them from 57 when they started actually actively thinking about vaccination and started vaccination to late 59, early 60s to uh, actually set up labs um, and, and production of the vaccine. So the patent did not immediate, the, the lack of patent did not immediately make it possible but in a, in a couple of years, um, even a really war ravaged and quite poor um, a country like Hungary could um, also uh, establish uh, production. But by then another vaccine appeared. And this uh, vaccine was uh, the product of collaboration between American and Russian scientists. This was, and you can see here on the, on the image, um, Mikhail Chumakov, um, Marina Voroshilova and Anatoly uh, uh, Smiradintsev. Um, he's, the, he's the man um, kind of leaning back in the corner, working together with Ar Albert Sabin. So Sabin developed his vaccine, but he needed a place um, to test it, to do mass vaccination testing. And together with Russian scientists, and also feeding into this were, this, uh, were scientists uh, from the Eastern Bloc, so Czechoslovak and Hungarian scientists, um, uh, partly, they finished developing the vaccine. So the, the vaccines and established the mass production of the vaccine and uh, did a trial that involved millions and millions of, uh, of uh, children across the Soviet Union. And just as these trials were concluded, the Hungary introduced the, uh, the vaccine immediately in 1959. It was one of the first countries to include it into its na national mass vaccination program. The reason for this is that Salk vaccine, which was 
working very well in most of the world did not work in Hungary. There was another big outbreak in 1959, even though the uh, children were vaccinated. The reason for this and figuring out this failure was very complex. And there was talk about the low quality of syringes and needles, for instance, that were leaking. There was talk about the method of the vaccination. Um, there were two ways of administering the vaccination, one way um, into un given under the skin uh, required less, dose, uh, less uh, vaccine in a dose. So Hungary opted for that to make the vaccine go a longer way. And, uh, and there was talk about the vaccine itself, if, if it's not as efficient as we thought. Remember, not that much time had passed before. And there was talk if the if people were not uh, willing to get themselves vaccinated, if there was a uh, if there was a resistance in people getting the vaccine, and this this was a, was a kind of created a circle of blame. Um, people, uh, the state, the medical profession, parents blaming each other for this failure. But in this moment came the Sabin vaccine which was um, uh, successful, it was easily administered. And we can see here um, an image where um, a child dressed up as the seven vaccine is uh, giving um, a young pioneer um, a dose of vaccine. So children got it with tea in a spoon um, in Hungary. And this kind of, um, uh, this vaccine that was the result of a collaboration between Soviet and um, American scientists and very much seen as, as, a, as, a, as a Soviet product. And with the very quick reaction of um, the Hungarian government to take this vaccine created a very strong um, pride and immediately concluded that this is of course due to, um, uh, to the, the state socialist regime that is in power and ideology that, um, uh, that heralded um, for everyone to have equal access to healthcare and for everyone to have access to vaccine um, uh, for free. Of course, um, you know, Hungary as um, administering the vaccine to its own population did not make that much of a difference globally. Um, surrounding countries were worried that um, um, Hungary using the live virus vaccine, which created a, 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 the circulation of the attenuated uh, virus, um, might leak, you know, these, this, these might leak into um, unprotected populations over the border uh, or uh, concerns. Of course, there were also concerns, and we can see this very well in, East and, uh, in the case of East and West Germany, of one type of um, political system being ahead of the other. Um, but in itself, it did nothing to prevent um, polio on a, for, for, the, for the global population. And even just getting the vaccine um, to Hungary or elsewhere um, became the, um, uh, the object of, um, of um, vaccine diplomacy. So vaccine diplomacy that we hear today, um, uh, hear a lot of talk about today is not a new thing. This was, um, uh, this was there already in the 1950s. You know, there were, of course, it's an epidemic situation, new vaccines, there were global shortages. So there were um, there was a lot of strategic thinking and maneuvering and diplomatic maneuvering of who gets you know how many doses and who can get their hands on vaccine. Um, more affluent nations were quicker to be able to um, produce their own vaccine uh, again um, uh, with the lack of patent, uh, and others had to uh, were buying and importing the vaccine, but of course it mattered how much it costs and how much is available. What I found is that, for instance, in the first purchase of vaccine from the U.S. to Hungary, that uh, that uh, took quite a bit of uh, diplomatic work. Hungary was not very um, accepted. Um, this new regime was not very accepted globally. And uh, the, as the UN was, was preparing a, a commission to assess you know, what had happened in, in the revolution, um, but they managed to purchase uh, a commercially vaccine from the United States 
in the American newspapers, this was presented as aid to Hungary and heralded as the United States giving aid to Hungary and sending vaccines. The way that vaccines traveled across the world also drew on pre-existing networks. And we can see this in the case of the Sabin vaccine. Uh, they were, um, uh, what we can see is Eastern Europe became uh, one of the first areas that was uh, heavily vaccinated with the Sabin vaccine, with vaccine coming from the Soviet Union. Cuba became the first country in the Western Hemisphere to eliminate polio with um, Soviet vaccine and Czechoslovak uh, virologists um, helping to organize the vaccination. And uh, what I also found um, is, uh, is that there was uh, also a very strong network in um, uh, unfolding of especially Soviet vaccines traveling the world. Um, 100,000 doses um, were, uh, were uh, uh, arrived to India, for instance, in 1961. 100,000 doses is not all that much, especially because um, you would need several um, uh, doses uh, to reach full immunity, but it is you know, it is indicative of the kind of um, connections that uh, that uh, uh, the Soviet Union was trying to make, and uh, and we can see that um, a lot of these uh, um, vaccine donations, or well, it's unclear for me right now if these were you know going the other way, if these were indeed purchased or donated um, to um, African and Latin American countries as well. So it was also about establishing global influence. And then um, the World Health Organization also had a very strong, uh, uh, strong role in this, um, setting standards of production and vaccination. So, you know, what is the minimum requirements that labs and uh, and uh, vaccine production sites need to have? What is the mode of um, uh, vaccination? And all the details, technical details of this, um, were standardized in the uh, in the WHO. And the WHO also did important validating um, work. After the Soviet trials, um, uh, certain countries, especially the United States, um, certain uh, uh, public health officials and virologists were hesitant to accept that actually, you know, the Soviet um, Union is, is um, the data presented is actually um, trustworthy. And uh, so the WHO stepped in to assess the trials and to give a stamp of approval that yes, actually what the Soviet Union is saying is so, we've checked it and, uh, and you can trust the results. And now um, that brings us to, you know, where we're getting um, to this point in um, vaccination where, where certain countries have eliminated polio, others are introducing it um, one way or the other into their uh, vaccination system. But you know, wow, what does this mean for the end? And I'd like to um, point out the importance here of declaring an end. And declaring an ending is a retrospective act, right? You don't know that something's ended unless you, you know, already some time has passed and you can say for certain, okay, that's, that is in the past, that is over. Um, so what is this de declaration? Um, what does it mean for public health and healthcare? Well, we have seen in many countries that there had been premature declarations of ending. We're over it, done, um, uh, uh, I think we did well, and then suddenly, boom, uh, uh, there, is a, there is a new wave, um, um, sometimes even a more devastating one. This happened in Hungary after 1957, when the, uh, a lot of the population was vaccinated, the government and uh, and uh, public health officials were really celebrating the the feats. There was no outbreak the next year, and it really seemed that this was it. Until in fifty nine, there was a huge new wave. The declaration of ending can also um, shift funds and focus to the disease um, nationally and internationally, uh, and I, I will um, talk about that in a bit. So when we declare that something's ending, it's not in, or not in crisis mode anymore. So um, funds might not be available um, for it that had been before. And the other, um, the, and sorry, we can see that I, I brought an example here in, for Ebola um, and Zika, uh, respectively, where um, the, the, the emergency declared is over 
and, uh, and funding is shifted to other causes. And uh, finally, the question who is left out of that ending, what kind of local, national, and global inequalities we can see in ending. So the going back to polio, in Hungary, there were no more outbreaks after 1963. And with this, that kind of blaming and question of why the Salk vaccine um, didn't work, um, I got a clear answer, at least in uh, uh, the way that it was communicated. Salk vaccine became in Hungarian eyes an imperfect technology. It was just not as good as the other vaccine. So all the complexities of you know, why the vaccine might not have worked or delivered the efficiency that was they hoped for got erased and uh, became a very simple uh, answer. The, as I mentioned, there was um, a huge, uh, the, with this ending um, uh, and working towards that ending, uh, the, so there was a huge uh, traveling of vaccines within the socialist world as well. And uh, actually, Czechoslovak scientists had already started raising the issue of possible eradication, global eradication of polio already in the 1960s. So 20 years before actually um, the, the polio um, eradication program was considered and kicked off. And when it was kicked off in the 1980s, this socialist story and the kind of socialist world's um, role in this, in developing the, the vaccination method and the vaccine itself, and its traveling across the globe was completely um, erased, it completely disappeared. And so that is also what had been brought by the ending, this retrospective um, reconstruction of the narrative that I was mentioning in the beginning. Another important thing to look at, uh, apart from you know, declaring an ending is the, what you know, often are uh, referred to as survivors. And this is also an, um, uh, a problematic term uh, of you know who we call survivors and what kind of um, meanings are attached to them, but what it really brings home is you know for whom does an epidemic end? Did polio epidemics end for people still living in iron lungs for decades um, even after after the the outbreaks ended? For people, for children who grew up disabled, you know what is um, that? Uh, uh, what ending are we talking about? And we can also see something different um, going on here. When, when in the middle of epidemics, we have this coupling of the chronic and the acute. So there's a there's a huge crisis in the the um, uh, the treatment of acute disease, but in the, at the same time as it's producing people. Um, <clears throat> With long-term care, for instance, for assisted breathing, or long-term care um, for the for the so-called long COVID, um, that is, you know, that is all handled um, uh, uh, together. The prevention and treatment, you know, there are uh, decisions on prevention and treatment, especially on a policy level, are taken together. You know, how are we going to balance this? What are we um, focusing on? Uh, but but they're all part of the same, and when. The epidemics end, this kind of gets separated. There's the treatment um, and maybe long term treatment, and there's um, prevention methods, and they become decoupled. And what it also creates then is, uh, is situations where the urgency is still there um, for a lot of people. And I've looked at uh, people living in iron lungs. Um, the urgency of care is, uh, is there, but the emergency, this idea of emergency is no longer, um, uh, is gone with the end of epidemic outbreaks. So it's not in emergency mode, healthcare uh, systems are not in emergency mode, people are not in emergency mode, but for many people, um, the urgency of addressing their um, uh, situation is, uh, is really uh, uh, continues. And just a, a, on a brief note, um, the, there, is, there is a lot of complexities in how diseases carry forward and meanings of disease carry forward. And uh, here is um, uh, the, the case of a um, Ebola nurse um, who uh, was featured on the, on the front page of uh, Time magazine as one of the people of uh, the year. Um, and uh, and um, a couple of years later, she needed urgent medical care, but was left. Um, no, people um, uh, did not 
uh, want to engage with her um, and even medical professionals were hesitant to, um, to engage and help um, her and, and do the necessary uh, interventions um, because um, she had had Ebola and because she was working with Ebola patients. And so in that sense, her body was carrying forward um, still the epidemic itself. And, uh, and sadly, she, uh, she died. This uh, led to her death. So this brings us to you know the, the key point and and also the the kind of um, end of our of a of this lecture of how can we think about these endings and you know what comes after and I think it's so important to to think about this even as we're we're uh, we're in this moment to 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 consider you know what are uh, what kind of things tend to be forgotten um, as we move forward, what kind of narratives are rewritten and to, to be conscious of, of that process that, uh, that we do make um, and some, are, uh, some of these processes are intentional, others maybe not, but to be mindful of, uh, of, of the way that narratives are, as I said, constructed at the moment, but also retrospectively, you know, who is not remembered who is um, left out? In the case of polio, um, you know this kind of social story, the the the, uh, the networks, the the political context is kind of um, uh, uh, forgotten um, as as polio eradication and disease uh, control becomes something different, um, something very different uh, um, uh, in the in the late twentieth century and today. There's also um, an interesting and important thing of, of how the disease changes after the end. And uh, what I mean by this, um, uh, I'll, I'll uh, show you through this poster of Jackie Chan, um, who's showing, and this is from a good couple of years ago, but this is kind of what led me and, and prompted me to think of the whole issue, where he's showing us that we're this close to ending polio. And this is part of the polio eradication program and some of you might be familiar with, um, with this particular uh, campaign. But what struck me in, is that when I first see this poster, I was uh, just coming from talking to, um, uh, to people who had, uh, who had polio and were living with polio. And were very much, you know, polio was very much, you know, had not ended in their lives and their number were, were, were many. Um, and so I, it prompted me to think what, ending are we what is ending um, on this poster what is Jackie Chan showing us and of course it is the ending of a virus and it's a very specific way of understanding a disease it's the ending of new outbreaks and it's the ending of virus transmission a very particular biological um, uh, meaning without the complexities of treatment without complexities of symptoms without the complexities of many many people hundreds and thousands of people still today who are living with the disease and will continue to live with the disease for the rest of their lives. So that is, that is one thing that, that, uh, that is very interesting, what happens you know, after um, there are no more outbreaks, what does this disease become? How does this the meaning of the disease change? And in different kinds of diseases, you can see um, this going on of something that uh, HIV AIDS, um, you know, the meaning of HIV AIDS as it changes over time um, with the removal of crisis point from certain um, countries and parts of the world to a chronic disease or condition. But this of course also links to this other point um, that I've mentioned before, you know, for whom is it after the end? You know, for whom has it ended, and where does it still go on? Uh, and but it's almost like a bubble or a or a deviation from the normal because this disease has ended already. There's also um, uh, what happens uh, is also a la loss of expertise and specialization that might come after the end. So what happened in Hungary, for instance, that there were no more outbreaks. So uh, uh, patients lost access to specialized hospitals, they lost access to specialized care. And over time and over the many years, um, no new people were trained in uh, polio care. So polio patients were the only ones who knew what was going on with their bodies, who knew anything about their disease. And so <clears throat> that kind of um, place of knowledge also um, changed. 
And of course, the after at the end raises um, the question of, you know, is this end a kind of suspended ending? Does it only um, exist with a continuous commitment to prevention? But then, of course, what if the continuous uh, uh, commitment of treatment is taken away, you know, with this loss of expertise and specialization? And what happens when something um, uh, something goes wrong and that prevention regime um, changes, um, which can be for, for various reasons? So this is basically what I wanted to um, come to in a roundabout way to think about epidemics also as um, in their temporalities and also as um, how we tell stories about them and think about you know, what the stakes are in determining an end, thinking what the stakes are in, uh, in how we think about disease, how we think about the people who are affected and, uh, and what the consequences of that are. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dora. That was... That was wonderful. Um, thank you. I think in this sort of moment um, for bringing a distance, a critical distance to the story of the epidemic, because what we are in at this moment, and very rightly so, uh, we have a commitment, as you said, a strong commitment to prevention, and that seems to be the end of it. But already, even within the span of a year and a half that we've lived with the pandemic, we know there is something called long COVID, for example which is what people are going to live with, with lung damage, with heart tissue damage, um, etc. And we are still to find out what the meanings of this are. And this is only something that, that's actually visible to us right now. There, there will be other things that we don't know that we will be dealing with that come along. And therefore, what do we call an end? And I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful um, because only a historian could do this job. And, I, and I'm glad to have, have your perspective on this. There's another point you raised uh, in, in your um, lecture, which was about the metaphors in which we think about um, epidemics. And it's, it's the metaphors of war, and it's the meta metaphors of conquest, and how do we win over, uh, over an epidemic, which is seen as an enemy, as a foreign virus, et cetera. And so it, it works on those lines. For, um, for our viewers, there's a fabulous film by the artist Miriam Ghani, which Dora, you might have actually seen already. Uh, it's called Dis-Ease and it's available to view until the end of the exhibition uh, on our web pages. So please do see the film. Uh, it's very, very intriguing. It's been made by an artist who looks into the language and our approaches. And, and the very thing that Dora talked about at the end of her lecture, which is how do we view and what is at stake in how we view disease? So it's it's a it's a fabulous note to uh, to uh, fabulous um, note to bring into this um, sort of soundtrack of the epidemic that we're all kind of living through and you know uh, it's bothering us. So without um, taking more time, let me now uh, look into the questions that we have from audiences. Do please give your uh, leave your questions in the Q and A box. Uh, the first question is from Shupriya Das, who wants to know, taking from the story of the Salk or the Salk vaccine, can history repeat itself? And this will be an opinion question, Dora, for you. Can history repeat itself with the COVID vaccines? Because currently many countries, including India, are constantly trying to circulate more and more vaccines globally, especially to, you know, uh, countries, uh, developing countries. So if the vaccines do in fact end up failing in certain countries or in certain locations, do we know from history what the effects might be? I think that's a that's a very good question and reflecting, you know, on the on the on the various um, um, various things that go into evaluating and declaring, you know, if a vaccine is efficient in in uh, uh, in as a as a preventative method, uh, method, and also what is a failure? You know, what can we term as a failure? And here, I you know, when I was looking into the complexities of this, you know, trying to understand what happened in Hungary with the salt vaccine, in the um, before the Sabin vaccine made an appearance, the, the most of the the conversation was around that the vaccine itself is efficient. But you know something um, went wrong, or that the vaccine is uh, perhaps slightly lower, uh, has a slightly lower, is on the lower end of uh, efficiency, and we cannot know. There's no way to know what the outbreak, the second outbreak, would have been, 
if there had been no vaccination. So a lot of uh, doctors argued that actually, you know, we didn't have, it was, it was a slightly smaller outbreak than the first one, and we didn't have a full-blown catastrophe because there was vaccination. So this kind of, you know, where is the failure uh, there and who's responsible for it, I think, um, is, a, is an important thing. And of course, again, a retrospective act. But of course, there are a lot of ways in which vaccination can go wrong. And that happened in, um, uh, with vaccination as well. With the Salk vaccine, for instance, in the United States, um, there was this um, very famous um, uh, incident called the Cutter incident, where there was a faulty batch of vaccines and children got polio from the vaccine. And so, you know, what that did to undermining the, the trust in vaccines was, of course, um, huge. But um, it was understood very differently for very different um, people. So within the US context, it was understood that there needs to be more federal regulation to make sure that everybody's, you know, that the production is safe and that companies you know, are liable for this and people are aware of risks. So there has to be more oversight. In Hungary, it was represented as, you know, well, there you go. You can see that capitalist uh, United States is only, only um, concerned with profit and they're willing to give, you know, like to throw their children into um, as sacrifices for, for this goal. So, you know, what, where that, you know, how that it's explained is very, it, it depends very much on the context. So, you know, coming back to your question, it depends, you know, on, on those political connections, on those cultural connections. It depends on, you know, how it plays out, what the, you know, how, how then it is retrospectively seen in light of other vaccines, in light of other relations, and so on and so forth. So it's very complex, and I don't think we can, um, uh, we can um, kind of divorce it from these, all these other issues. Thanks, Dora. Uh, Amartya Sinha would like to know, uh, how important is it to quantify the end of pandemics, whether it is enough to declare the end of disease scientifically, or if the public managing the public perception of it is seen to be more important. So, what what is your learning? I would my my um what I would like to see. <laughs> let me put it this way: yeah. is uh, is is more is just more attention to the multiplicity of these endings. Yeah. There is definitely, I mean, you know, incidence rates are are you know real and and they're they're changing and disappearing or rising, and that is a very important marker, yeah. right? But but um, and I think that is what leads um, policy overwhelmingly. So the quantifiable bit, but what is quantified is also a question, right? Um, uh, the the quantification of incidence rate, not for instance the people living with long COVID or the effect on um, on on society, which can be quantified in all kinds of ways. So so that I, I would I would argue that there should be a, a more uh, multifaceted way of determining ends, and there should be attention to that endings happen for in different aspects and at different times for different people. Because if we only concentrate on this biological and or scientific in this sense, on the virus itself and nothing else, then you know we lose all the people living with long COVID, we lose um, the support for them. And for them, you know, and, and for, for societies, the epidemic might be, you know, um, going uh, going on uh, for a longer time. So it's, it's it's not only taking into account the aftermath, but rather taking apart where this ending is and, and being very clear that there are very clear consequences if we declare something to be, to have ended. Hmm. So uh, I'll ask you a historical question um, because that's what we are historically good at answering. Uh, you know, Looking at the context of the Cold War, which is what you've looked at for the polio vaccine, and looking at, say today, what would you, what would be the key specificities that um, sort of signal how, you know, the trajectory of the vaccine during the Cold War, and, and what would you identify as similarly sort of key things that determine um, the trajectories today? I know the second question is not not as they say part of scope, but um, just just you know a speculation because I mean this is 
so you know we think of course uh, in our times so to speak but we are able to identify specificities um of the past in a way in which we cannot today but is there something that we can bring from our understanding of politics in the past to um, to today i think the perhaps the the international i would i would point out the international aspect of this mm -hmm. and the and the global aspect um and and the two things one is that that uh, it was very clear to me the very important role that organizations like the WHO can play, and uh, and the the you know the the real value, like very concrete value in the existence and the work um, that that international organizations do. And of course, you know the, what comes to light is also how it's extremely you know complex and problematic in many ways. You know, just to mention that that in part of the the story, um, Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union were not part of the WHO because they left um, uh, for for reasons of their own, where, which were partly you know partly geopolitical, but I would argue that partly justified because they had a very different idea of what an, an international organization should do. That it should be you know it should be supporting with materials and it should be more you know um, hands on. As opposed to the, the kind of um, technical assistance that uh, that the United States mm -hmm. was pushing, so there were there were a lot of you know and 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 a lot of uh, you know other um, uh, interesting things going on. But overall, there was um, uh, an important pro uh, role that the WHO played in creating this kind of anchoring um, the uh, and 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 reducing the uncertainties among the different vaccines and the vaccination methods with. Um, um, with teams of uh, and, and committees that were made up of you know um, people and virologists and, and experts from from all over the world to consider and to um, to create that and of course making it possible to to be a kind of um, uh, neutral um, uh, player in a in a very heavily um, uh, contested world. And the other the other issue is is this kind of collaboration and and to see what what it highlighted for me is that we tend to see the world, um, especially in in this kind of in its geopolitical tensions, you know, as 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 very clear cut that you know Soviet Union against the United States and and you know we can see those those mapping on in their conversations regarding China and 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 the United States and the UK and the EU and and you know all that um what it also shows us the story is that it's well, I know that historians always come to this that well it's more complicated than that um, but but it's uh, but it's true um that there were you know very unexpected things happening um and much more dynamic relationships than we allow it for and and there were a lot of also a lot of genuinely you know people who genuinely wanted to help and there were a lot of you know political intentions and game playing as well but not necessarily mapping on to what um what is uh, what we expected otherwise yeah i don't know if i froze there for a second but um <laughs> yeah, you did but i think the point came through and i i, I expected um you know what doesn't fit the company narrative or what doesn't fit the, the given narrative are things that need to be teased out because of course as thank you very much dora this was and so just to just to remind our audiences um and my internet connection is unstable at this moment um we have tomorrow christos linteris another colleague of dora's and mine who will be speaking about the the emergence of epidemic photography. So for those of us who know about the emergence of public photography and what impact that had on how we under, visually understand epidemics. Um, so he'll be speaking about that. His a photo essay of his is a part of the exhibition. So please do go have a look at that. Uh, and my colleagues reminded, just reminded me that we have a Wendell Stanley lecture, the Lindau lecture, um, in the exhibition as well, which speaks about the polio incident that and so please do go have a look at that. Historical documents are incredibly important for us to understand what's happening now and, and therefore why people in a way react the way they do. So reactions are not necessarily things that you can actually pre-script in a way. And I think it's, it's um, you know, the agility, the dynamism, and also the humility to understand those responses that allow a public health system to deal with an epidemic probably far better than 
um, you know, uh, they would if they didn't uh, pay attention to it. So Dora's lecture today is a part of a 23 lecture series, as I said at the start, all of which supported by the Indian National Science Academy. Uh, these are recorded lectures, thanks to the agreement of our speakers, and they, are, they will be available on our website as a collective for anybody who wants to uh, utilize them, um, you know, for public, further public engagement, but also to listen to them for themselves, uh, non-commercial use only. Um, do check out, uh, do join us actually uh, for the visit to, to the Robert Koch Museum. Um, it'll be a walkthrough and we will get to hear many more historical stories uh, about, the, about the Koch Museum. Uh, the feedback, we'd love to hear from you and respond to it as well. And uh, thank you for being with us this evening. Most of all, thank you to Dora for taking the time to be with us this evening and look forward to seeing many of you tomorrow uh, for Christos' uh, talk and for the young amongst you for the workshop in the afternoon with Matt Adams on creating interactive art, uh, given his experience, uh, spending more than a year in the shock room of the World Health Organization where well, effectively, among other things, global pandemics are declared. Thank you again and have a good evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dora. <laughs>